good evening everybody who has joined us today it gives me great pleasure to be in conversation with professor ruki lal and before we start our conversation i'd like to introduce uh, professor lal ruki lal is an acclaimed historian of india who recently published biography empress the astonishing reign of nur jahan won the 2000, 2019 georgia author of the year award in biography and was also a finalist in history for the los angeles time book prize among the top 10 picks of time magazine the telegraph and the prospect magazine london empress has been lauded by the new yorker the guardian the new york times the bbc the indian express business standard and numerous other national and international journals magazines and newspapers she is a professor of south asian history at emory university and divides her time between atlanta and delhi Welcome, Professor Lal. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be in conversation with you, Rana. And please call me Ruby. <laughs> and I've been reading the book and just loving it. Thank you. So, um, uh, the first, you know, the thing that strikes you when I was reading the book, it's your introduction and your dedication. So I'd like to start with that, if I may. Sure. You dedicate your book to the ancestors of India's women and a plural heritage. Can you tell us more about this dedication and identifying yourself as a feminist historian? Because well, I'm sure there are many girls here who would love to hear the answer to that. Sure, that's a that's a that's a beautiful question, and actually, uh, you know, you touch uh, the soul of my work in some senses. You see, um, I think one of the major questions for me while writing this book uh, was how did Noor Jahan do what she did? um and what did she do uh you know when we think about the great moguls of india we think mainly about the male moguls of india um and there was one woman amongst them and that was nur jahan uh, who as um you know i launch her in the book was a co-sovereign uh, with jahangir she was his uh, 20th and last wife she had been previously married um and uh, she was the mother of a daughter so it's a very unusual uh uh you know history it's a very unusual inheritance um that she embodies and then comes uh to the to the to the haram of jahangir uh, and becomes his, his 20th wife uh the question was uh how did she do it uh and this was a question that was posed to me repeatedly uh, you know when i when i gave uh talks and um you know engaged in conversations with colleagues and other people uh um, how did she i think the question was how did she do it back then and in india um and the and the and the and the book really essentially answers that that biography really answers that um that question uh and i would like to just say a few things about that so that i can you know connect that to the beautiful question you you asked here um there are many things that went into the making of noor jahan so to speak you know the incredible um uh, aristocratic parents who come from Safavid Iran to India her father the great Gayas Beg one of the most eminent uh, courtiers gets employed in the in the court of um, uh, Akbar the great Noor Jahan's um, uh, father in law uh, her amazing mother Asma the whole tradition of Sufi poetry the whole family is really very deeply engaged in uh you know poetry writing uncles and 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 grand uncles and so on and so forth so there is this amazing literary um, inheritance that she has um the 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 second amazing thing is this first marriage which is written off in literally one sentence that she was married to ali kuli khan and she went to bengal well what was bengal like uh you know she spends 12 years in bengal she has a child from this marriage so just very quickly Bengal the land of the uh, of the Bengal tiger Noor Jahan was this amazing shot Bengal the 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 land of uh, you know direct relationships with god uh, uh, you know thinking about vishnu thinking about saraswati all the play of uh, direct union with the divine so this is her legacy and then she comes into the haram she is put in charge uh, of three amazing uh, matriarchs that include Jahangir's mother as well as stepmother um and so this is the legacy that we are talking about and then of course there's the person of noor jahan right there were 20 there were 19 other uh, fabulous uh, wives of jahangir so how come noor jahan really uh, you know uh, achieves this splendor uh, that's one side of the story and the other side of the story 
uh, also is this conversation you and I were having briefly earlier on, really the land called Al-Hind, uh, a one that Persians and Arabs called the land across the river Indus, which, which had this richness of, um, to use the modern vocabulary, uh, you know, richness of, of, of plural ways of being, of thinking, of experimentation. Um, so for instance, when she marries um, uh, Jahangir, uh, there was a Jain monk that had been uh, in the court for a really long time, since the time of Akbar the Great, a, a, a monk called Siddhi Chandra. And uh, Noor Jahan and Jahangir uh, have a conversation with him uh, in which uh, Noor Jahan teases, his, uh, teases him about the pleasures of, of the flesh because he says to her, you know, uh, I think it's very good to be abstinent. And so she says to him, well, if you haven't experienced it, how do you know that, uh, you know, so th th this is the uh, playfulness we are, we are talking about. This is the land. No, I'm not trying to romanticize this. This is a land that has, you know, other kinds of ferocities and so on and so forth. But um, then you think about Jahangir. He is, you know, he's actually half Rajput Hindu uh, and half Sunni Muslim. You think about Noor Jahan. She is, I would call her culturally Shia, right? Uh, because this is a family that's open. Her father particularly, I mean, I think if her father could describe himself, he would describe himself as a man of letters. He's a, he, his, his calligraphy is, you know, beautiful. Uh, he loves poetry. Uh, he's a fine courtier, right? A deeply involved in adab and so on and so forth. So the land, um, uh, the, 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 the land, the Indic culture, if you will, right, has all of this. And this is really where my dedication comes in. You know, I feel our ancestors, uh, particularly our women ancestors, um, you know, have, have, um, have embodied these uh, different senses of being, different senses of, um, uh, of, of taking on different kinds of practices. So my mother, for instance, right, who's a who's a who's a practicing uh, uh, Hindu, um, she says uh, that when she walks in front of a mosque, her head bows. When she walks in front of a gurdwara, her head bows. Right. So it is this. Um, I think of myself as a descendant of, um, you know, this kind of ethic, uh, and I really believe that this is the India, um, you know, we are losing. Uh, there's this kind of very dire um, demand to really declare ourselves, to declare ourselves in one way, right? You're a Hindu, you're a Muslim, um, that, a, that, a, that, a, that a Hindu um, can be deeply Muslim oriented, uh, that a Muslim can love, um, you know, Vedanta, right? This, this seems uh, almost Un unfathomable to people, but it wasn't. So this is a very long way of saying, uh, you know, the dedication is to that people and to that history, uh, that history that is rich, that is varied, that is multiplicitous. Um, and I think Noor Jahan embodies that. And that comes through so beautifully in your book also. And I love the way you have written it. And, you know, it's been very, very lovingly written. And you can see that this is somebody you admire hugely. Now, to, when we are talking of history, uh, as is today, where you've talked about it, you say by 18th century, three fascinatingly different versions of a birth story had been published. Mm -hmm. Each revealed a great deal about the teller and his times, and the writers were all men, including prevailing attitudes about politics, gender, and religion. So how important is history, uh, historiography? And if you can tell us about your methods of research, because today there are so many questions being raised on historiography on you know every second day this, uh, recently it was Nur Jahan's birthday and everybody had the story of being abandoned by the road which you have talked about how the story came about so can you just tell us about those three accounts and uh... yeah I think I think um, I'll come to the three accounts part after I respond a little bit more generally about uh, another really great question but this is also really the question of sources or how to write this history or what constitute the legitimate grounds of writing history. This is, 
This has been a question I've been engaged with for about 20 years now, uh, starting with my first book, Domesticity and Power in the Early Mobile World, where I, uh, you know, began to think about uh, what is this haram, so-called, uh, you know, uh, how, you know, what is the space of the haram? Uh, when was this actually, when did it actually come about? What is the, what is the philosophy around it and so on and so forth? And the charge as early as that book uh, that uh, a Mughal historian uh, put to me was, well, how are you going to do this uh, history? There are no sources for it. Um, and, you know, uh, even at that time, and of course, of, you know, uh, hundreds of years, we've had uh, the great official chronicle of Gulbadan Kano Begum, daughter of a Babar, sister of Mayu, uh, aunt of Akbar the Great, and it's at uh, you know, the request of her nephew Akbar that she writes this amazing uh, uh, account. So that becomes the centerpiece of writing that history. I say this because, um, you know, uh, 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 historians uh, in the main field that there are only certain uh, textual histories or visual histories, and actually, interestingly, it is true both for textual as well as visual histories, that are the legitimate uh, sources for writing. And um, I say this because uh, anything that is state sponsored, such as the Akbar Nama, or written at the behest of, even if, let's say, non officials are writing, but if it is written at the behest of the emperor, that somehow becomes, uh, you know, legitimate, that somehow becomes uh, uh, authentic, that every, that, that you don't need to question the facts after that, right? Um, likewise for visual, I mean, for a long time, I know that this has changed uh, dramatically and, and, and all to the good. Uh, art historians believed that only those um, Mughal miniatures were legitimate that complemented a textual account, right? Now that has been challenged uh, really beautifully and very, very powerfully in the, in the works of any number of uh, very fine uh, art historians. Uh, likewise, um, you know, in the case of Noor Jahan, one of the things uh, I was fascinated by when I began this research is how deeply she dwelled in public imagination, right? How stories after stories of Noor Jahan were told. So for instance, we know this amazing Kabutro ki Kahani, right? That yes. there are, and there are, it's a, it's a, it's a palimpsest. There are versions upon versions of this, which is, you know, that the, so this is essentially a princess and a prince story. And it could be Salim and, 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 and Noor Jahan, or it could be anybody that they meet. Sometimes they meet in a garden. Sometimes they meet in a bath. And you know he's holding these two beautiful pigeons, and he says to her, he, the beautiful woman that he sees, he says to her, you know, will you please hold on the pigeons? And she holds on the pigeons, and he, uh, I, I mean, I'm going to the bath or I'm going somewhere else. And when he returns, he sees that one of the pigeons is missing, and so he says to her, well, what happens to the to the to the pigeon? You know, it was a bright pigeon. And she says, well, it flew away. And he says, how did it flew away? How did it uh, flew away? And so she raises her hand, releases her grip, <laughs> lets the other the pigeon fly, and she says like this. And so he loses, you know, his heart to her. So this is an amazing story, right? It's, it's where does the story come from? The story is actually first found in 19th century Urdu renditions, right? Um, and several authors wrote about it saying, We've heard it from our, from our, you know, older people. So the life, so the public imagination around the splendor of Noor Jahan is really quite um, formidable. Then in Agra Fort, I, I, I spoke with a lot of uh, tour guides. Um, and uh, one of them, he, when he spoke about Noor Jahan's splendor, I, I mean, you could see his eyes lit. You could see... The most fabulous storytelling emerge, and one of the stories very quickly he said was how she used to sit right next to Jahangir in the court, and if she agreed with any decision, she would just pat him on the back. <laughs> that meant that the decision was right. Now, none of these are in the these stories are to be found in let's say uh, in the 16th century textual, uh, you know, um, uh, records, court records, or otherwise. But the point is, do we then just discard these? And I didn't want to discard the legends, right? Uh, I took history as well as legends of this kind, uh, you know, very seriously. And so did I 
you know, I, I decided, and this comes to the three um, quotations that you that you take at the end of a birth, right? Uh, from Manucci um, uh, and from uh, uh, you know two other people, uh, the 18th century recordings. Kafi, uh, Kafi Khan is one of these people. The issue here is uh, how the splendor or the power of uh, this woman is being imagined, right? Uh, and it is to unpack that splendor. The only thing we know at the time of her birth. Uh, in the sense of contemporary documents, is that she was born outside Kandahar in 1577 as Gayas and Asmat left uh, the Safavid court uh, and came to uh, Agra. Right? That's all we know. Uh, but then people are besotted by it. Manuchi is besotted by this. You know, Khafi Khan is besotted by this. And they don't just simply write dramatic scenes. They actually use very interesting language of their time to depict what's happening. So Manuchi, for instance, is using this um, highly uh, Christian motifs uh, of St. Joseph, uh, you know, his, uh, so, so Asmat is like Mary upon a horse and St. Joseph leading the way. You know, it's a, it's a very powerful imagery. Or if you look at, uh, you know, Khafi Khan, he is using this lovely imagery of migration, right? Uh, of what happens when people leave the land, when you go from one land to another. And to me, this public imagination, if you're going to write a book um, for public, right, uh, you want to take this one seriously. Uh, you, want to, you want to come into how the public is imagining her. Um, and you want to bring your own expertise into conversation with that. So really, again, this is a very long question, uh, answer to your to your. You know, lovely question, but um, I think the, the the there's a lot at stake in what we do, right? As you know, what do we take? What do we leave? Who decides? As I said the other day, you know, in in, in our conversation, who decides that this is legitimate and this is not legitimate? No, I think the answers and the way you've described it and the symbology of the descriptions, those are very beautifully done. As you said, Manuji is using the in a symbol of Jesus and uh, Mother Mary and Joseph and uh, Hafiz Khan is using a migration allegory. So these are very beautifully described and that is how you understand also the period of what is happening at that time and what is going on in the mind of the people. Exactly. And uh, uh, you were talking about this uh, poem, oh, sorry, of this meeting. I remember, I just remember two lines from it uh, we learned in childhood about uh, Mehrun Nisa and uh, Jahangir. So, उसकी दो लाइनें शुरू की ये है कि सुने मेरी महलता मेरा कबूतर दूसरा कहा गया छत से छत से that one line I still remember very clearly, So you are right, these are public people are interested in this. This is public uh, imagination of the splendor of a woman. Yeah. You know, then again the, the you talked a little bit about their meeting, that these are the stories. But how did they actually meet? And then you also describe yeah. about and uh, Puni Khan's death, because we have such again lurid uh, tales about how he was, Jahangir got him murdered and he had seen mm -hmm. Nur Jahan, he wanted to get married to Nur Jahan, and, you know, Mehran Nisa, and he gets the husband murdered and brought, she mm -hmm. is brought to So, can you just talk us a little bit through that also? Yes, uh, so so here is the thing the, the there's a lot of legends around roman, romance of Mehran Nisa and, and, and Jahangir. Uh, but uh, in terms of the and and again, as I said, I, I bring those those legends uh, out in order to suggest how uh, the, the, the that, that there is a romance in people's mind to the marriage that takes place in 1611. Right. I mean, that's how they're, they're, they are depicting it. And in a in a public imagination, it is not wrong because the marriage with with Jahangir actually becomes an exceptional marriage. Right. In that. This is the only man in whose reign there is a co-sovereign, right? So, so it is an exceptional circumstance because it's, um, you know, it's with all 
the beauty and the charm and the upbringing and the experience, it is a deeply feudal patriarchal world, right? So to have the support of her husband, um, uh, the, the emperor, but also her father, uh, Gayaz Beg, who by this time is the Bazid, right? And the incredible matriarchs in the Haram, this is very, very critical. Uh, but in terms of her first marriage, uh, you know, uh, again, we, we do know Ali Kuli actually also comes from Iran about the same time that uh, uh, that her parents come. And and he's, he's uh, you know, a young wanderer who's, who's trying different kinds of things. Uh, and eventually he serves in the in the Mughal army and, and is, is successful and is introduced uh, uh, you know, to the to the to the court of um, uh, of Akbar and is an employee, uh, and again we don't have the details in any of the records, but it's pretty obvious that Ghayaz Beg at some point, uh, you know, sees this uh, Persian wanderer and is um, and there is a sense of affinity clearly, um, you know, as far as that history is concerned, and that marriage takes place, um, and it's a long marriage in which she you know goes to Bengal. But the circumstances of Ali Kulis, and this is what I tried to think, you know, what was her life like in Bengal? And the one way in which to think about uh, her life in Bengal was to really think what was happening. See, Bengal is the first state, uh, one of the earliest states that uh, in the East that comes into the control of the Mughals, right? And at the time of Noor's marriage uh, and her uh, life in Bengal, the center state relations are very iffy for want of better word. That is, an employee in Bengal must pay obeisance to two centers of power. One would be uh, in Raj Mahal, which is the capital of Bengal at that time, as well as in, in Agra, which would mean for a medium class uh, officer like Ali Kuli, he would have to be out of uh, you know the house quite a lot or the mansion quite a lot, that is to pay visits, to make arrangements. Uh, then the situation in Bengal itself, like in many provinces of, of, of India, right? there were any number of zamindars, there were other officers and so on. So there was a huge amount of negotiation in the local politics that took place. And so Noor Jahan will watch all of this. right? Uh, there are no more children uh, with Ali Kuli. Uh, and he is, you know, by all accounts, uh, you know, fairly... Uh, uh, you know, in quote unquote, lonely, the only person he has in terms of clo close intimates. There's no record of any of his relations in, in, in India. So it is Noor Jahan, and clearly there's a lot of exchange that takes place, and then there are letters and so on and so forth. So Bengal is really quite critical because Noor Jahan um, is being formed here, right? She's really learning the politics, if you will. Uh, and then, uh, so I'm not going to tell the whole story because I want our viewers to read this amazing story of how he gets, you know, involved um, in this battle with the governor who comes from Agra and, uh, uh, you know, is murdered. Um, and then it is then that Noor Jahan comes to the Haram of, uh, of Jahangir uh, under the protection now. In Agra, in this whole machination, her father and older brother is also involved earlier on. Father is then released. The older brother is hanged. All these kinds of things happen. And the classic you know, thing that happens in circumstances like this is that the family of an officer is always brought to the haram. Although in this case, uh, you know, Ghayas, uh, Ghayas Beg is, of course, the vizier. Her father is the vizier. Um, and so three years into the staying, this is the historical, uh, uh, the, the, in other words, the textual evidence that we have uh, that uh, in May 1611 in the Mina Bazaar, uh, Jahangir sees her. And what is the Mina Bazaar? This is the official royal uh, bazaar in which curiosities from the world come, uh, very special uh, you know, merchants that also involve lady merchants, uh, sell the goods of the royal family. You know, goes by, and she was in the care of. She's the daughter of the vizier. This is what people forget, right? In some of the earlier writings, she's called the lady in waiting. I mean, the daughter of the vizier is not the lady in waiting. So she is, and and that's where uh, uh, you know Jahangir uh, sees her, uh, and that's where the wedding takes place. So that's the uh, you know first historical account. So it's this beautiful setting of the Mina Bazaar um, is my understanding that. 
you know, uh, kindles the imagination of the public. Uh, and then I suppose the romance stories are, uh, you know, uh, they, they, they come into view. I also sometimes think I have no historical grounds to uh, establish this, but I really believe that uh, somehow uh, the idea of anarchy, right, uh, is actually the idea of the uh, of, of Jahangir's. If if anarchy was anything, then I think it was no Jahan, because it is that unrequited love of of Jahangir. Uh, possibly for Mehrud Nisa that's been, you know, put on to uh, this figure called Anarkali. And again, there are, you know, lots and lots of questions around that because Anarkali, the figure, first emerges in uh, William Finch's account, uh, you know, very, very early. But then uh, people have also suggested in some histories of Lahore, it's been suggested that she was actually one of the wives of, of Jahangir. And, you know, we know that there is a um, uh, whole Anarkali Bar in, in, in Lahore uh, and so on and so forth. And there are tombs. So, so which then you just talked about uh, Nur Jaha coming to the harem and there's so much of curiosity about the harem as well as a lot of fanciful about written about it. And you've uh, studied that very deeply, especially for your first book, Domestic Domesticity and Power in the Early Mughal World. So can you just describe, because mm -hmm. I had there are a lot of young viewers over here. I'm sure they would love to hear the description of the harem and an authentic version. Yes. So that you know, whenever, because all these people who hear us, I hope they start posting authentic stuff on their Instagram and Twitter feed. Because we every day we have you know a lot of people posting now a painting or a monument, and you know there are some, of course very good descriptions, but many descriptions are way off. Yeah. So I think they benefit if you can just describe the harem for us. Yeah, yeah, great question. Actually, I'll start by saying that here at Emory, I, um, there's a freshman, so the incoming class, um, uh, usually there are about 18 to 20 students. And I teach, I taught this course for about eight years. It's called Harem Tales, because in a, in a more orientalized version, it's called harem, whereas the word has her uh, and ma, which is harem, right? Okay. Um, and so when I meet these students, I ask them, what is it that you know, draws you to this course called, uh, you know, Harem Tales? And the answers are really interesting because this is what people think about the Harem. Uh, the answers are, um, oh, isn't this like a space where, you know, all the, uh, all the women lounge about naked and then the Sultan comes, often they say Sultan, and then the Sultan comes and, and, and they're awaiting, you know, pleasure and there's a there's a black eunuch holding grapes and so that's one imagery another student called it a nunnery um uh, another student said uh, isn't this about just you know a lot of sex in this one place so there's a whole sexualized imagery of the haram i want to just speak about where that comes from um and this comes from uh, actually the unavailability of the idea of haram. See, haram uh, is a very sacrosanct space in the history of Islam. The earliest usage of the haram is actually to the most sacred two cities uh, in Islam, Mecca and Medina, right? So um, so they, they, they are the, they, they are the um, uh, if you will, haram al-sharif, uh, so to speak. Um, but over time, somehow the idea of haram has become this idea of women living behind the walls. They're completely segregated. Uh, they're veiled. All of these kinds of things. If you take the example of the Mughals, okay, Babar and Humanyu, as as I showed in my in my first book, uh, these were wandering, peripatetic, nomadic kings. Uh, how did they claim their kingship? How did they think that they were illustrious kings? By drawing amazing genealogical connections, for example, to Timur and Genghis Khan's five generations earlier, who were their, their forefathers, or by acts of chivalry. Uh, by, by, you know, Babar had won three times the, the seat of Timur, um, Samarkand. And this was a great, um, you know, every uh, kith and kin of his family line fought over Samarkand. So this this idea of the space runner, right? You know, that formed uh, that formed the king. 
uh, or the or the or the great other the compartment you know how do you meet when do you meet these were the things that were really critical to the kingship of babar and and humayun with humayun once uh, he ascends the throne in 1530 in delhi uh, you know a more formal courtly ethic begins to to emerge but he's still wandering he's still moving he gets defeated by sher shah suri he goes to iran for over a decade then comes back it is under akbar his son the third mughal emperor that you have the beginnings of what we can see uh, you know the early concrete mughal splendor in the form of cities in the form of houses um, in the form of palaces so fatehpur sikri the red sandstone fatehpur sikri is actually the first city that has the first walled haram that is that is established right uh, this is a very important thing to remember but it is not that akbar chooses arbitrarily to form he has by this time the moguls have arrived in india right this masses territorial uh, uh you know holdings uh, taxation system is being formed administration there are marriages with with rajputs so the settlement is absolutely necessary right to to the the wandering in peripatetic ethic remains uh, but not like babar and humayun right it is not Uh, you know parts of central asia to afghanistan and on to india constantly uh, there is peripatetic ethic but within the indian subcontinent so you know and it is very important for akbar to claim those grounds of sovereignty he wants posterity to remember him as this great monarch and it is part of that seeking the legitimacy that he commissions the first official history of the empire which is the akbar name right and it is part of this ethics that he wants uh, you know abul fazl amongst others of course you know create launch this emperor in 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 various uh, writings so whether you take the akbar nama you take the tarikh e alfi you take any number of accounts badayuni with all his rant is actually really thinking through uh, you know the 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 sovereignty of the emperor and scores of uh, you know paintings i mean a uh, wise hamza nama being cast at this time about the great victories of the prophets uh, you know uncle uh, you know manuscripts of that kind and so the haram is part of that but, but the way he conceptualizes haram is by philosophically uh, that is in the words of abu fazl and others by linking it to the philosophy of um uh, you know the space of uh, spaces of mecca and medina in other words that uh, you know the, this 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 haram is amane patcha is 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 sanctum sanctorum that this is where women are elevated right they are lifted they are sacred uh, they are on high because the emperor is on high they are an extension of him nonetheless his aunt gulbadan will not have it because for the first time they are declared pardegian in the history of the empire, uh, of the of the empire this is in this is instituted in the ayna right which means the veiled ones um so it's a huge shift from a nomadic ethic to a more settled splendor right and part of this is let's say domestication of 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 women so haram is that right uh, this is the beginnings of the haram but the point is uh as i remind my students uh the haram doesn't hold women's minds they do not hold women's curiosity so uh you know but how do women respond to this charge it's very interesting they're not going to respond like you and me right they're not going to say to hell with it i'm going right but gulbadan does that she says to hell with it i'm going but she uses the language of hajj right she takes 11 women which is an extraordinary unparalleled incident um and she goes to mecca and medina right uh, and the remarkable thing is uh, and this is you know something that i've been i've been uh, lovingly agitating over what made her stay in mecca and medina for 5 years right uh, uh, you know yes she's doing the hajj but the interesting thing that's coming out is also people writing on the hajj show that the hajj for women was not just piety there was so much else that was involved in it so these are things that we have to um uh, you know think about 
uh, when we when we think of spaces like like the haram, because the spaces are not just that spaces happen and then people are planted in it and somehow we are locked and we are finished. Uh, you know, we are thinking as we are today. People were back then thinking, uh, you know, their life, wondering, you know, how to be, how to live, how to accept that. You know, you don't just accept something that's been laid down in the books. We never have. Um, so I think that's the um, imagination or, you know, the history around the haram that we need to bear in mind. And there were some pretty powerful women staying inside, especially the matriarchs. Yes, and yes, the, indeed, indeed. And I just mentioned Gulbadan, but there's, uh, you know, uh, there's Akbar's mother, Hamida Banu Begum, who's, who's a classic matriarch in that, you know, she's, a, she's, a, she's an interesting person in that, that she's, you know, after the early, uh, there's a very beautiful exchange when Humayu wants to marry her during the, uh, you know, wandering peripatetic times. Um, and she says to the to the to to her mother at that time uh, that you know um, I want to marry a man uh, whose collar I can touch, not a man whose skirt my hand doesn't reach. Now this this is so laden with meaning about uh, uh, you know what kind of life he has, uh, the issue of you know the the this is pre rights language, but I'm using it. But you know equality of status, what is my status going to be, you know, with this man who's lost, uh, you know, so much of his of his kingdom and so on and so forth. But this woman, by the time Akbar ascends the throne, is, is, a, is a very classic matriarch, which is that she's besotted by her son and the son is equally besotted by her. I mean, the Akbar Nama is so rich in how wherever Akbar is, she gets to meet him, right? She comes to meet him. And so she doesn't go to the Hajj. She's already performed the Hajj in the 1560s alone. So she doesn't go on the Hajj with uh, Gulbadan. But she also stays back because when uh, Akbar goes to Kabul against his half-brother, she serves as the governor of Delhi. So there are all these things that really tells you about how you know, power of women, exactly, the power of women and the reliance of uh, you know, men on these amazing women. Another thing that you mentioned, you mentioned a little earlier that uh, Nur Jaha was the co-sovereign. Now she appeared in the Jharoka with Jahangir, which was a, which is again unique because no other woman did. She issued Karmans in her name. Yet we, you know, like when we do not think of her as a co-sovereign, we think of her as a kind of a scheming woman. Hmm. Do you think that she, you know, like the Basha ke naam se khutba hota tha, padha jata tha, or Friday in the Jama Manjil? Do you think, uh, or why do you think that a khutba was never read in a name, or had a khutba been read in a name, her uh, position would have been sealed for posterity? See, I think, first of all, the status of the khutba in Mughal history is very, very uncertain, right? When, um, you know, when Humayu becomes the king, uh, Kamran actually has uh, a khutba read in his name, and then they go to. We were speaking about amazing women in in Mughal history. Khanzade Begum, the great, uh, you know, sister of of Babar, and they say, you know, the, so the, there's this kind of conflict that's going on between the brothers, while Humayun has already been, uh, you know, become the sovereign. And she says, uh, uh, you know, uh, it is no point doing this. This is this has been settled. Right? He he is the emperor. So the best thing is that we, you know. Uh, no need for all this. So they actually approach her about, uh, you know, shall we or shall we not uh, declare the khutba? I say this because, um, you know, uh, Jahangir never abdicates the throne. So there is no reason to have a second khutba declared. Nonetheless, right, the clerics are completely happy with the emergence of Nur Jahan's power, right? Uh, because there are other signs of sovereignty, right? It's not a, see, uh, my own understanding is that it's not a checklist. There's just so much that has happened, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in her time. So the coins that still survive, um, this image of the Jaroka that, you know, I've reproduced in the book, uh, but also any number of informal signs of sovereignty, such as hunting tiger. She was an amazing shot. Um, and... Uh, you know, the idea behind uh, hunting tigers particularly is deeply linked with sovereignty in Islam. Not uh, any Tom, Dick and Harry could hunt 
uh, you know, tigers. It had to be a sovereign, and she actually hunts a killer tiger in order to protect her subjects. Right. So there are there are issues of these kinds. Um, the incredible. Uh, uh, so so this is a uh, this is a question on um, reflection on inner life of Nur Jahan that I cannot establish by way of of, of uh, documentation. And yet I can. So here's an example in the in the caravan sarai uh, near Jalandhar, the, the Noor Mahal uh, uh, caravan sarai, which is one of the most amazing architecturally trend-setting caravan sarai, uh, as you know. Uh, but also, it is at this amazing juncture of Grand Trunk Road, right? Um, it is the thriving place where all sorts of merchants uh, from Western Central Asia to, to to other parts of northern India, so internal and external, that are that are passing by. By one account that I read of Wayne Begley, uh, you know, he wrote that when the inn was in its full splendor, right? At that point, it could house up to four thousand merchants and as many horses. Now, this is an incredible space, but what is even more incredible is the outside. Right on the facade of uh, the inn, uh, the inscription with four lines survive, and the last line has it not exactly, but something like this: that this inn was built at the uh, at the at the at the orders of Noor Mahal Pacha. Uh, I'm sorry, Noor Jahan Pacha Begum. Right? There is this inscription for posterity. Now, women had built monuments before, not not monuments, mainly mosques before. So here is a public monument with an inscription of her name, right? And likewise, if you look at Nishan, so scholars know that there are Nishans. Ten of these survive, starting quite early, actually. One starts in about uh, 1620s uh, from Gujarat. And I saw the stamp on top and the stamp uh, you know, below the royal uh, symbol, uh, which was usually in the form of a rose, um, rose petals. It says, uh, the signature says, no, Jahan Pacha Begum. It's a really interesting uh, signature, her name, and then Pacha Begum, right? I mean, we can literally unpack this term, the Emperor Begum, so to speak, right? The Empress Begum, so to speak. Um, so there is this, it seems to me, a, a very interesting uh, thought process that's going on in launching her. Uh, sovereignty. Very interesting. And uh, the way you start the book itself with that tiger shoot in Mathura, that is very impactful. And I would suggest to all those who are listening, please do buy and read this book. You'll learn a lot from it. And uh, coming back to Nur Jahan, there is this chapter that you've written on Fitna. Mm. The Fitna is that uh, I've heard very often, and it's used as you know, for civil strife and uh, disturbance. And you, there seems to you describe it as an innately destructive element in women. So how do you place this in the uh, context of Nurja? Because you traced it from the time of the Prophet himself. Yes. Or after, not mm -hmm. in the time, after the, just after the Prophet, you traced it from his wife, Aisha, and you brought it to Nurja. And I found that very interesting. Yeah, uh, you know this. Uh, th th this word is—it's got just such an amazing history. So let me just very quickly sum up the history, the uh, uh, the uh, or at least one strand of that history, which is that um, when the prophet passes away, uh, there's a battle of succession, and his, uh, you know, last um, his his very uh, favorite wife Aisha, uh, you know, uh, uh, goes into the open and fights. Uh, a battle is called the Battle of the Camels, very famously, Battle of the Camels against Ali. Um, and that is the first time uh, the word fitna begins to, to appear in, in uh, historical consciousness. And essentially, you know, it means civil strife in its early beginnings because there's this, uh, you know, question of succession that's going on. It means chaos, it means division, lots of things. Uh, but over time, historically, um, and again, people have written extensively about this. I mean, uh, you know, women writing uh, on on uh, Islam have written about this, that fitna somehow comes to be attached to women. And almost always, and this is where you were reading that, uh, 
you know, citation that almost always uh, it's attached to women's sexuality, um, but it is also attached to women's actions um, that women produce chaos, that they sow dissensions, right? Mm -hmm. And so what happens in 1626 in Noor Jahan's life is, and again, I won't go into the whole story because I want our readers to read this amazing moment in this history because it's also linked with the disappearance of Noor Jahan in history. So what happens in 1626, a year before Jahangir dies, is that one of the courtiers called Mahabat Khan, for a variety of reasons, holds the emperor acti uh, um, captive. Um, and he uh, uh, he neglects, and this is the amazing scene, right? For some reason, and again, beautifully documented, um, he neglects to to take Noor Jahan capture, which is which is a mistake. He really uh, you know, agitates over. So Noor Jahan gathers, uh, uh, you know, uh, all the um, major noblemen of the empire, um, and actually goes on a battle upon uh, an elephant. Uh, to fight the forces of Mahabad Khan. And actually, that is the scene outside Amar Chitra Katha, if, you, if you've ever seen Amar Chitra Katha or Noor Jahan. You know, she's on this battle in a palki and, you know, it's, uh, I'm sorry, on, a, on an elephant in a palki, seated upon a palki and, and going. She loses the battle, so she strategizes again and eventually defeats Mahabad Khan. Now, at this point, two things begin to happen. One is that in the records of the time, the word fitna begins to appear. So here's the thing, the clerics were okay as long as, you know, coins were being issued, even if she came on the Jaroka, which was a public viewing, that's fine, right? But she really crosses the boundary uh, in their minds um, by coming on to the territory of uh, absolute male, uh, male territory, which is war. Uh, and this is just unfathomable. And I say this because uh, by, the, by the side, you know, um, by the side of this depiction of the fitna, you also have Mullah Kami Shirazi, his Fatnama and Noor Jahan Begum, which is this beautiful hundred page account. That is the one account in which you don't see the word fitna. The damnation is not there. But it's also interesting, you know, and then of course Shah Jahan is the stepson of Noor Jahan, which earlier they are you know, in great concert with each other. But eventually by 1622, he realizes that she's not going to be on his side and she really wants her uh, son-in-law, the fourth son of uh, Jahangir, her own stepson, um, uh, Shahriya, who marries Ladli, her daughter, right? So he's, he's very threatened. He also classically, like a lot of Mughal prince, he also goes in revolt by 1622, goes into parts of Deccan, emerges again, goes, comes back. So there's this very stifling history. Uh, and eventually, he is the son-in-law of Noor Jahan's brother. Um, and by this time, her brother begins to oppose um, uh, you know, his own sister and allies with, with Shah Jahan. So this is the, the male world you know, beginning to come together. And it's really interesting. In Shah Jahani Chroniclers, she is completely wiped out. Right. There is there is no uh, sense. And of course, we know this whole history of how many times Shah Jahanameh were produced. You know, one was written for over 10 years and then he completely removed it. He wanted the lunar calendar, uh, you know, chronicling of, 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 of his history. So there's a lot that's going on. But I want to read you one section from the, from the Shah Jahanameh, which is really interesting, um, which is when Noor Jahan dies uh, in 1645, here's what uh, the Shah Jahanama says. And I read this for a, for a reason, and I'll tell you the reason. Here's what it says uh, when she dies on November 18, 1645. In the city of Lahore, the queen dowager Noor Jahan Begum, whom it is needless to praise, as she had already reached the pinnacle of time, departed to paradise in the 72nd year of her reign. The renowned Begum was the chaste daughter of Itmadu Dola and sister of the, of the late Yamin Dola, that is her brother Asaf Khan. From the sixth year of the late emperor's reign, that is her husband Jahangir, when she was united to him in the bond of matrimony, she gradually acquired such unbounded influence over his majesty's mind that she seized the reins of government and abrogated to herself 
the supreme civil and financial administration of the administration of the realm ruling with absolute authority till the conclusion of her reign so it's damning and yet it's telling you yes. how how um um how absolute her power was right and as i as i as i went through the shah jahani chronicles i thought to myself you know uh, it is a woman's power and you know she will just will herself onto history i mean that is really uh you know the story here so the erasure is very early you know this um you know it begins uh, there's this kind of um amazement at her power very long amazement at her power in her own time and yet there is bewilderment right and that really comes to be by the end of her reign that really grips uh, and then there is this complete um, if you will erasure in history and then after this you have 18th century accounts such as mohammad hadi uh, who still uh, you know is is amazed at the at the glory of uh, of nur jahan by the 19th century uh, typically in colonial accounts she becomes the oriental queen Uh, then there's further erasure i mean there, there's kind of knowing and not knowing if you will that is now you have the kissa uh, you know kissa kahania around the pigeons around you know the meetings around the romance so as i say i you know the romance really locks her in a way in which her biography was removed right from history and that's really what i wanted to i mean her love story is very beautiful right i mean this is not to undo love i'm all for love but i think <laughs> if love will make you diminished uh, that is that it will that it will diminish the most uh, splendid achievement of your life then that's not good love in our minds right i think it's you know the power that she wielded that led to the erasure because the people writing after her especially the shah jahani historians and the later on they wanted who could not fathom the fact that any woman could be that powerful that's right. so they had to find explanation including including her fitna exactly i think there are a lot of questions so uh, we'll take the questions uh, can we just put them up here ishan okay please discuss uh, nur jahan's contribution in architectural plan fabric new design of garments architectural plans uh, ruby has just discussed she discussed the nur mahal sarai So can you talk about uh, the garments and the fabric? Uh, yeah. What influence you had in that? Mm -hmm. Rana, could I just quickly mention because I think it's really important to mention this in the mausoleum of her parents across the Yamuna, right? Yes. Uh, yes. the uh, the tomb of what is called as the tomb of Itmadu Dola but it's both of Itmadu Dola and uh, Asmat Begum uh, her mother uh, you know that really becomes the inspiration for the Taj Mahal it's yes. use of marble its positioning its 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 use of pietra dura for instance um and actually i love it even more than the Taj Mahal because of its intimacy and its it's you, you know you you kind of bond with it you feel that there is a that there's a feeling to uh, the, the 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 building itself but as the taj mahal is intimidating right it it you are in awe of it so uh, but on the fabrics you know this is um, when she comes to the haram and this is documented very very beautifully in the in the textual traditions um she uh, she did two things or at least two things that are recorded which are suggestive of how many things she will have done one is she gave dowries for 500 poor women right which is a great act of 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 compassion and likewise she began to design some dresses and these dresses are actually still sold in the bazaars outside the red fort it's called the noor maheli um and it was an inexpensive uh, bridal dress uh for women so so that's uh you know we know this uh, quite well people confuse quite a lot of the time the uh the rose itar that 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 her mother made actually asmat begum uh it's a very beautiful uh episode that jahangi records and it's in my book um but that's attributed to to her mother so the aesthetics are in dress in fabric um uh you know there's this uh, amazing image of her my favorite image in which she loads the gun 
which is held in the Rampur Raza Library, also reproduced in uh, in the book. And one person, I mean, she wears this, you know, gorgeous see-through, uh, uh, you know, uh, long, uh, what we call kurta today, um, but it's 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 a it's a long flowing uh, dress, almost like you know, made of chiffon. But the trousers underneath are really quite amazing. They're, they're, they're striped. So even if the great portraiture maker Abul Hassan imagined it, he imagined it out of something, right? Uh, and then you begin to see in every image the pearls. The pearls are really quite incredible, right? Um, of course, pearls and rubies were also the favorite um, uh, you know, gems of Jahangir. Uh, but you see her wearing pearls uh, uh, you know, quite a lot. So there's a this, this, this kind of very powerful um, aesthetic uh, presentation. In fact, pearls is what he presents to Asmat Begum also after the uh, she after produces. The right. yeah. uh, next question is from Abhigya. Why do you think that only the romantic aspect of Noor Jahan's life are famous among people? That's a good question. I think, uh, you know, uh, this is what is deeply linked to really not believing in women's power, right? Um, I think there's this kind of gut reaction. And if you know, uh, so for instance, I'll respond to this lovely question by saying that, you know, Noor Jahan is one of those women about who we have copious amounts of evidence. We've been, we've been, Rana and I've been discussing this, right? Uh, she's the first woman I want to emphasize to be actually portrayed in the court. Uh, and this is established by art historians, which means that before her time, women were suggestively made in the imperial paintings, which is that the painters didn't have access to, to, to women, uh, particularly in the Akbari Atelier. But here you have the actual representations uh, of, um, of Noor Jahan. So you have this, you have this amazing uh, poetry, you have her own designs, you have her own poetry, you have you know, uh, uh, several court uh, chronicles that are writing, you have the colonial writings, and yet uh, one historian said to me, uh, you know, isn't this representation? And I turned around and said to him, well, what is, yes, I said to him, what is not representation? Is the Akbar Nama not representation of Akbar, right? Is, 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 is Baba Nama somehow, although it's a diary, isn't he representing something about his own life, right? Uh, so the, the issue is to, to answer your question, there are too many doubts around women's power, right? So when I spoke, I did a lot of interviews uh, in Lahore as well as uh, you know in India, uh, and people knew these things. People said, oh yes, yeah, she was very powerful. She issued coins in her name. She had you know these imperial orders, but they were, uh, uh, you know, like what I call bullet point history, like one liners. So what I had to do was to concretize this history, to really, you know, set the scenes around when was she doing it? How did she come to it? What did it look like? What was ongoing? Um, and it is this act. And I think it is the act of repetition. So if you know the story and if you read the story, as Rana was saying, you know, do uh, some good, powerful postings, okay, about this powerful women uh, in Mughal history and 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 this great co-sovereign, this great ruler of, of, of India. I think that's going to change that. So, um, you know, why is important, but let's also change it. Yes, because as I said, so many people are putting up uh, Instagram and Twitter posts on uh, paintings and on Mughals and women. So it's very essential that you should read uh, books written by scholars. The next question is, what explains the lack of mention to Noor Jahan and women in general in the Jahangir Nama? You know, actually, that is not accurate. Uh, uh, Jahangir Nama, this is exactly uh, something scholars believe that, uh, you know, Noor Jahan is not mentioned in the Jahangir Nama. If you look at the Jahangir Nama closely, there are over 30 entries on Noor Jahan. Okay. Uh, and... Uh, one of the major emphases in the, uh, one of the major emphasis in this in, in these uh, several entries is her hunting, and I just said that hunting is important because it was a sign of 
sovereignty, right? An informal sign of sovereignty. So Jahangir, when a chronicler writes, suppose, you know, we are writing a diary today. We are not, although these are very, very different genres, but I'm just trying to explain an act of thinking, right? If we are, if we are writing a diary today, we are not going to sit um, and say, um, you know, my, my uh, Rana Safavi, who I was talking to, uh, is such and such. She was born on such and such. She was, you know, I write in a stream of consciousness, so to speak. And that's exactly what's happening in the Chronicles, right? Uh, people are writing in a stream of consciousness. Let me explain this further. So Jahangir and Noor Jahan are the most itinerant of the imperial couples. They're barely in one place um, for more than you know six to eight months. The longest they spend is at one time for three years in, 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 in Agra, but otherwise they're constantly on the move. So I had to chart. This is one of the reasons why she comes out of the haram and, and emerges into this co-sovereign mode all over again. Now, the interesting thing is I had to chart these itineraries, but I could not do that only through the Jahangir Nama because it's written in a stream of consciousness style. Sometimes the dates are back and forward. Sometimes the names don't appear, you know, things like that. So he, any chronicler is not going to write uh, in the ways in which you and I, uh, you know, feel is best. They are going to write the way they write. So, so this is where, uh, you know, historical training is very important. You begin to understand uh, by, 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 by training and by learning what the technicalities are of these sources, right? Why do we need to read um, in Persian? Why do we need to do, um, uh, why do we need to understand different uh, early modern maps, uh, things like that? So, so, so this is what is at stake. Uh, Ishan, okay, next question. When the administration and politics wonder Nur Jahan, what were the reaction of the princes, especially Shah Jahan, the heir to the throne? Uh, yes. So initially, uh, uh, Shah Jahan uh, and Noor Jahan, uh, you know, are, are very, very closely uh, uh, bonded. Um, and a lot of the very important news of Shah Jahan comes to Noor Jahan first. So for instance, in 1614, which is within three years of a marriage to Jahangir, so you can imagine how, how splendid the rise is, he, he, he wins Mewar. And this is a very important victory for him because you know what was really important in um, in the in the in the um, CVs of the Mughal princes was you know major victories, um, uh, you know military experience, uh, establishment being governors, establishment uh, of a different harem, and so on and so forth. So there were there were different kinds of uh, requirements, but these are not formal, but they are expected requirements. So Mewar is really very important, and the first. Uh, intimation of that victory comes to comes to Noor Jahan. Likewise, his initial victory in the Deccan is con, uh, is conveyed to Noor Jahan, and this is a really interesting moment because when he comes back, uh, she hosts him. His mother is 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 present uh, uh, at this time, uh, but the mother does not host him, which does not mean that she may not privately have hosted him, but. The depiction, the pictorial depiction, is of Noor Jahan hosting Jahangir um, and and Shah Jahan. So the relationship is very interesting in the in the in the beginning because there's there's great clarity. And while he is the presumptive nominee, um, it isn't clear. It is never clear in 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 in, in Mughal history because the law of primogeniture doesn't exist, right? So uh, you know the battles will be will be fought. Uh, you know, dissension will take place. History is, you know, it, it ends up in a way in which over time, of course, it becomes clear that the elder succeeds, but it is not uh, written in the in the in the in the laws. So the relationship is is strong. It's 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 close, but I think things begin to shift quite remarkably when Noor Jahan has to think from sixteen, kind of late sixteen twenties, what will to happen to her daughter Ladley. Right, and by this time, her niece Mumtaz is already married to to to, to Shah Jahan. Now, Shah Jahan was married twice before. Uh, by the time he marries Mumtaz, but Mumtaz emerges as the key important wife. Um, and if he, if if she was going to think of Shah Jahan um, marrying uh, her daughter Ladli, 
this would be a very awkward situation. So he was, I mean, some, some observers have suggested, was this possible? I do not believe that that was possible because she would be second rank straight away and Nojan is not going to have it. And so the only prince that's left who's malleable, who's young, who she thinks she can train is Sharia. And really, this is really, uh, uh, you know, where the differences between um, Shah Jahan and, uh, and Noor Jahan begin to, to, to appear. And by late 1621, he's not in the marriage. Um, early 1622, he declares that he's in rebellion against uh, Jahangir and, um, and Noor Jahan. So this is the, the history, this is the, the bifurcation. But of course, after 1626, as I was saying, several historians begin to write that she sowed the seeds of dissension. Again, the word fitna is used between, father and, between the father and the son. So this has been such a fascinating discussion. I think we'll take a last question because we are already, we've gone over an hour. Uh, Diksha asked, in a hypothetical world, Noor Jaha wouldn't have been the kind of empress she was. What do you think would have missed from the Mughal world? Wouldn't have been the kind of impress that yeah. she uh, Yeah, if she, uh, so in other words, I think the question you're asking was if we didn't have a co sovereign, yes. uh, what would the Mughal world look like? And you know, uh, here's the answer um, it, twen it took 2018 to launch the co sovereign, and the M Mughal world looked like a very male world, right? Uh, in terms of imperial power, people, people know that there have been these amazing women all the way through. So the point is, uh, you know, how to really think concretely and succinctly and repeat the power, right? Um, so yeah, it would have looked like a very male world. <laughs> so it's been a fascinating discussion, Ruby. Thanks so much. And I hope all the people who have been joined by quite a few people, I think, uh, that all of you have learned and please do buy the book. I have a Kindle copy because I couldn't uh, get a physical one in the lockdown. Otherwise, I would have shown it to you. But uh, you can get a Kindle I or you can buy it. If you have, please do show it. Yes. Beautiful. And the cover itself is so beautiful. So, okay. the astonishing reign of Nurjah, please do buy it and do read it. And thank, thank you. you. Lana, it's been a great pleasure and honor speaking with you. And thank you to all our uh, you know, yes. listeners and viewers. And thank you to Ishan and Karman. Thank you so much. Okay. Good night. Take care. You too. Bye.